Hello, today we're going to be talking about ancient Ghana, one of three medieval African kingdoms. As always, you should have your notebook open to the correct page. At the top, you should have the title of the notes. You should also draw a line about two and a half inches from the left-hand side straight down. This will divide your notebook paper into two sections. Area A will be where the area you put the keywords in. Area C is where you'll take most of your notes, draw your little diagrams, bullet notes. And finally, area B is where you'll do your reflections, summaries, or questions that you have for me. Today's video includes the Trans-Saharan trade, the indigenous religion of Ghana, how Ghana remained united, and the influence of Islam upon the region. Here we have the ancient kingdom of Ghana, geographically located between the Berbers to the north and the Wangarians to the south. One of the first challenges of getting to Ghana for the Berbers was crossing the Atlas Mountains. After making it over the Atlas Mountains, there was a nearly 1,200 mile desert stretch before making it to Ghana. Camels were perfect for crossing the desert. They could carry heavy loads and they can keep their footing on the sliding sand. They could also go a long time with water. If treated well, camels were patient. On flat ground, they could even run very quickly. They began to be known as the ships of the desert. Once the North Africans had made it across the desert, the sounding of drums would open the marketplace. It was then that the Wangarians would get in their canoes and bring their gold. And it was here in the Sahel on the banks of the Niger River and the city of Kumbi that the trades were negotiated. The North Africans brought with them salt in exchange for gold. They traded it ounce per ounce. In fact, two-thirds of the world's gold at that time came from West Africa. And the Empire of Ghana used its geographical location and its military strength from iron weapons to tax the trade between the Wangarians and the Berbers. This made them incredibly wealthy. This was a typical Ghana marketplace. Let's take a closer look. Here we can see that the structures in the background are temporary. They're only going to be around as long as the market's open and then they're gone. This is a market that moves all the time. Now let's take a look at the people. They're not all of the same race. In fact, look at these individuals here. They look like they're from Arabia. Finally, if we look closely, we can see that it's more than gold and salt being traded here. Other goods were also being traded, cloth, tools. One of the most popular things traded was tortoise shells. Now let's take a look at the popular religion of Ghana. That was animism. Animism is the oldest form of religion in Ghana. Modern day voodoo actually finds its origins from animism. This is not to be mistaken for what is shown in Hollywood movies. Animists believe in many different gods, creator gods, lesser deities. There are gods within trees, within rocks, within mountains, within streams. Some of them have a moral guiding, guiding to them, and some of them just exist. There are some oral histories that suggest uh, human sacrifice may have been used to appease these gods, but also animal sacrifice as well as dance and song were used to hopefully keep away bad spirits or bad times or drought. Now let's take a look at the king of Ghana. The king of Ghana was considered a wise man by his people. He made and enforced all of the laws of Ghana. He also taxed all trade going through the country and established a silent bartering system. This helped regulate the gold and salt trade and helped maintain good trade relations. 
To enforce his law and keep his kingdom safe, the king relied on a large army. Some records indicate that it may have been up board between 100 to 200,000 soldiers, as well as nobles helping him run and organize the army. Although most of their economy came from the gold and salt trade, a large portion of their population actually worked as peasants or farmers, and they donated a portion of their product or their crop to support the merchants and kings, nobles, and priests within the cities. The last thing I'd like to cover is the influence on Islam on the Empire of Ghana. Inevitably, the traders brought Islam with them. Within the city of Kumbi, a separate Islamic community was established. It had its own mosques and schools. The king drew scholars from the area for their bookkeeping and literary skills to help run the administration of his territory. Because of these new skills, many king's children and children of the nobles found themselves learning Islam by going to Muslim schools, learning how to read and write and do mathematics. There were numerous reasons for the decline of Ghana. The king lost his trading monopoly. At the same time, a drought began and had a long-term effect on the land and its ability to sustain cattle and cultivation. Within the Arab tradition, there is knowledge that the Amoravids, a Muslim group, came from North Africa and invaded Ghana. Other interpretations are that the Amoravids influence was gradual and did not involve any form of military takeover, yet a slow political transition from animism to Islam. In any case, Ghana, the king of Ghana lost his power and eventually be overtaken by one of its provinces, the province of Mali. Here we are at the bottom of our notes. This is the summary section. This is where you need to go back and read through your notes and create some sort of connection. So the response is going to ask you to either summarize or draw some graphics or even come up with some questions that might show up on a test or questions you might want to ask me. You want to do this at the bottom of every note page.